Well, here we are again, back for another official Scottish Rugby podcast. We're a bit thin on the ground. Jamie's uh, on holiday this week, Al's still on holiday. Rachel and I are here and we're joined, delighted to be joined by, by Kyle Stain, Glasgow Warriors and, and Scotland back. I'll start with you, Kyle. How's uh, how's this week going? Early part of the week, but how's, uh, how's things treating you so far this week? Oh, hey, Moss. Yeah, thanks. Very good to be on. Um, oh, it was a good day for us. Great to be back at Scotston and, and only have a five-minute trip in the car. Um, as you know, the last five weeks we've been going to and from Murrayfield and Orium. So I think most of the boys were happy to be back and we were welcomed by this uh, consistent downpour um, <laughs> just as we had to go train outside again. So home sweet home. Is it with you, Rachel? Is it, is it as wet with you as it is with us? This is the first time I think I've trained in rain in a very long time. <laughs> Which is maybe a little bit smug of me saying that, but um, is yeah, that because you've not trained, or is that because it's been so great? <laughs> <laughs> it's been locked down. No, it is not because I've not trained. The weather has been really nice. <laughs> oh, Kyle, you said it's it is important to get back, isn't it? I know the five weeks you've been working hard with the individual fitness stuff and accommodated the BT Manifield, but uh, it does make a difference to get home. And you were saying that you're still, you know. Can you regulate it quite heavily at Scots and there's weights out in the track, is that right? And you're not allowed into the facility itself, it's just in and out of the car and onto the training field, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, so again, it's, you know, you'd think you'd be used to it by now, but it's still quite weird going back to Scots and with all these, these strict regulations in place. So they've turned that indoor athletics track into all our gym bays. Mm-hmm. Um, luckily, we didn't have gym today, so we just um, yeah, came in, got tested, got the cotton bud up the nose, and then we were out onto the, out onto the pitch for an hour in the rain and then home. I've heard a few stories or I've heard a few uh, experiences. It's difficult to test, isn't it? It's, it's, not, it's not the ple- most pleasant thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's not nice at all. I don't know how to describe it even. Just like there's just somebody like scratching at the back, at the front of your brain through your nose almost. <laughs> okay. how, how often are you guys having to have the testing done? Uh, every every Monday. Every Monday, is it? Yeah, so there's nothing like Sunday blues to know you've got to go in and <laughs> test first thing on Monday morning. Um, oh. But I suppose from a peace of mind point of view, it's good for the yeah. boys, you know, by yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the results come back the day after and then the, the rest of the week, you know, it's, it's kind of based around that knowledge of knowing if there is a, and unfortunately have a, a case, then you can manage it and isolate it as, as, quick, as, as quick as possible. Yeah, exactly. So Monday, they, they just keep us away from each other. They're not allowed to touch anybody, no contact, none of that. Um, so that if there is a positive, then hopefully you just have to isolate whoever that is. And then from Tuesday and stuff, we're starting to bring in contact between like two or four of us maximum. So what kind of stage of training are you guys at? Now, we spoke to Sam uh, last week, but he's obviously based down south. We've got slightly yeah. different regulations. So what kind of stage are you guys now at in terms of contact and whatever else? So this this week back now, it's got some, so it's from tomorrow will be the first time we're allowed to, allowed to have any sort of contact. And I think we're in groups of four they've put us in. Um, and still no no bone on bone, just um, just on the bags. Um, so with all the new breakdown regulations and all those kind of things that have come in, Danny's got us um, hitting the bags as often as we can. Um, are you um, are you happy with your group of four? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I've got, I've got Squigsy who loves the contact more than anybody else. He does, yeah. <laughs> that comes that comes barreling in there. <laughs> um, and other than that, I've got I've got uh, Hugh Jones and then um, one of the young boys, Ollie Mobile, that's coming through. So. Um, yeah, it's just the three of us versus Squigs, pretty much, just to try and calm him down. Squigs is uh, Nick Grigg, for those who don't know, but he's a, he's a pocket rocket, isn't he? He flies yeah. into contact. Well, you can see that the way he plays, but uh, the thing about Squigs is he does it with a smile on his face. Yeah. It's never an aggressive look. It's just flying in, but he still has a smile on his face. Yeah, exactly. So you don't, don't know what to make of it. <laughs> you stand up and you give him like the dirty eye and he's standing up smiling at you. And you're not <laughs> you know? I know. We spoke about that last week with Sam. They were further ahead in terms of their contact and they were back to full-on contact and we spoke about how to manipulate a group of four if you can choose your group of four for full-on <laughs> contact it's uh it's sometimes better but uh the coaches think differently don't they they like to put you against similar positions so you can push each other on or inspire each other or yeah sometimes well, it goes the over the top. but also at the same time you don't want to mix too many similar positions because if one of us mm. tests positive then you've got yeah. to isolate that whole four mm. yeah um, so, yeah, it's, it's, the logistics of it become quite interesting. It is that, isn't it? There's so much planning in terms of a, a normal pre-season or a normal preparation. But to build in all the regulations and, as well, it is a, a big undertaking for players, for coaches. It's a big discipline, but it's absolutely the right thing to do. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. 
But, but what about stage? Are you, Rachel, you said you were training today as well. Where, where yeah, are you so kind of returning to play stuff? We're slightly further ahead of um, the women up in Scotland at the moment. We are officially like returned to stage one this week. Mm. Um, so we're back in small group training, uh, obviously non-contact and gym sessions, etc. So we're quite lucky um, in that respect that we're kind of getting to do a little bit more um, getting to do a bit more now so I'm excited about this week so we've got a lot of skill type sessions in which has been completely gone for the last however long so that'll be cool. Nice. How far away are you guys from games? Um, so we don't really know yet <laughs> is the honest answer. Um, it's still a wee bit up in the air. Um, in terms of club stuff that'll probably come back sooner um, I'd imagine than, than international um, down in England and then for Scotland um, hopefully before the end of the year, but we don't know at the moment. It's good. And you said, Kyle, as well, like um, different regulations or different, it's not really regulations or laws around the breakdown around the contact that you'll be working on tomorrow, but there are changes. Coaches are always trying to evolve. There seems to be a, a desire to get, quite rightly, a quicker game or a quicker breakdown. What we've seen yeah. in the, the super rugby staff in the Southern Hemisphere. So, well, tomorrow, yes, you'll have the element of contact and, and get that, that feeling of hitting bags and hitting people again shortly. But there'll be a technical change as well. It'll be quite difficult to kind of uh, work on these nuances. But is there anything specific that you think will change or you're trying to do in terms of quicken the tempo or obviously yeah. pay for it to clear out? Um, yeah, well, I suppose one of the things they've done as well is try and make that breakdown a bit safer. I think, you know, mm -hmm. try and take out all these side entries that might blow out someone's knee. So mm -hmm. um, definitely the one thing that we're going to have to change that we put a big focus on was what we called man on fire. So mm -hmm. you're carrying the ball into contact, you know, you being able to roll and, mm -hmm. and sort of crawl forward before you have to place the ball to try and change the pictures. Whereas now they've changed that explicitly to one dynamic movement. So yeah. That's so, going to be quite interesting, I think, because... Yeah, I think it's so easy to say that like that's something you've got to change, but when that's something that you've had drilled into you for, yeah. for such a long time, just second nature, it's, it's such a difficult thing to, to drill out of you. I mean, we spent I ages last season alone just drilling man on fire as well, mm. that kind of spending time on the ground. So I'm, I'm nervous to get back and get ping non-stop <laughs> and training for doing it. <laughs> I know, but I'm sure as a flanker, you must be licking your lips at the... <laughs> At the thought, you know, that the ball won't change. You know, they've got one movement to make. And yeah. You can be in there and, and over the ball. Yeah, definitely. I think, to be fair, myself as a flanker, I'm not the most um, jackling type of flanker, which is something yeah. I definitely need to work on. But I think there's players like we've got a wee, um, seven, Rach McLachlan, who loves to jump mm. on the ball quickly. And for the players like that, I think it's going to be, you know, brilliant for us. So... Yeah, I think it's going to change the game quite a bit, for sure. Yeah, the man on fire stuff, it's, it's almost, it's that, you say, kind of that secondary movement. It's, so it allows, if you, when you're tackled, you can actually steal a yard or steal an inch or just twist and turn so that the defending players can't get onto the ball and slow it down. Yeah. So does that mean, and, and re, it's a difficult one to referee that and officiate as well, because sometimes you can't help but move. And exactly. if you're allowed one, yeah. what's one movement? You know, you're not allowed to kind of get back up on your knees again. But I suppose, does it mean that, the footwork and the evasion pre-contact or pre-tackle becomes probably double important, really, because you want to make the space before the contact or, or ideally run through the space so you don't have to be pinged for rolling about like a sheep in his back. <laughs> no, exactly. This is true. Um, Bogues, Jason O'Halloran, just left us, and yeah, his favourite his favorite little phrase was footwork and fence, so I'm sure he'll be licking his lips at that as well. Mm. Um, but we'll get in there tomorrow and see what JD's, JD and Danny have got planned for us. It's quite a quick turnaround in terms of obviously new rules and only just getting back to contact now and having a game mm. um, next month. How are you guys feeling in terms of that quite short turnaround in terms of getting back to contact and, and getting used to these new rules? Yeah, it's quite an interesting one actually, Rach, because um, there's a little bit of I mean, and oaring, you know, between us. You know, four weeks' time, we've got to, we've got to go out there and play a full 80-minute game and you kind of wonder um, how, how the bodies are going to cope. So I'm sh I think we're all kind of hoping that as we start the contact now and get back into it and we get a feel, you know, you'll, we'll all have a better idea of where our bodies are at um, and then know how we're going to, how, how we'll cope with it. But I yeah. think at the moment there's just so much we don't know about where we're at or where our bodies are at, you know, so. Yeah. I suppose, I suppose that the comforting thing in many ways is that everyone's in the same boat. Yeah. You know, if, if you've been injured or if you've missed a period of the season, you come back in, maybe with these doubts and these concerns as well, 
but you're coming into a situation where everyone's been playing or most others have been playing consistently. Mm-hmm. So it's almost when we do come back in a month's time or, or whenever the, the start date is for different teams and players, everybody's going to be in that, that same boat of, I wonder what this is, I wonder what's going to happen. Will you have a chance to play against each other in any way, stretch or form, like before, before an actual league game as such? Yeah, no, that's definitely the plan. Um, so I think the first game is the 22nd, so probably yeah. two weeks before that. Um, in that week, I think there is there is talk of, um, I don't know whether it's going to be like three 20, three 20 minute classic. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> um, which will really put a smile on Squiggy's face, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> if it's ever off. But no, that is important, isn't it? It's that, that kind of graduated return for a, a, you know, your body, your physicality point of view, but also your, your, your mindset point of view. It's such a long time since you've played. Yeah, and, and going into a league game, usually there are warm-up games or friendlies or you know hit outs before a, a meaningful league game that carries points. Because Glasgow can still could still qualify. I think if they won both games with bonus points and Ulster didn't pick up anything, I mean there yeah. is still an unlikely chance, but there's a chance. Yeah. So you want to be in tip-top physical and mental condition going into that first game against Edinburgh. Yeah, no, exactly. And I mean, even more so, you know, the 1872 Cup sitting at one mm. all at the moment and we, of course. You know, we lost the last time at Murrayfield. So, um, yeah, there'll be a lot of boys wanting to go and make right down there. Um, and obviously, uh, a new coach for you guys um, going into this as well. How, how are you feeling about that? We had much contact in terms of what you've done so far. Is that kind of what this next phase will be working with um, them? So I suppose, I mean, they've had to adapt massively. Um, you know, it was quite awkward or quite weird, you know, saying goodbye to... Dave Rennie on Zoom and then, you know, mm. and Danny, Danny in on Zoom. Um, so I think it was a little bit frustrating, I'm sure, more for them at the moment, at, in the beginning, you know, that the, they were struggling to get all their messages through. So um, I think slowly they've started to introduce, you know, the direction they want to go. But I think mainly for these first two games, you know, they want to keep the bulk of it the same um, and not change up too much, you know, and try try build consistency through that. And then I think slowly they'll start filtering in. Um, you know, more sort of the specifics of where they want to go. I can imagine it's a really difficult time to, to take on a new role like that. We had, oh, um, yeah. we had a new S&C coach come in just um, at club just prior to lockdown, I think the week before. So yeah. he was having to programme us over lockdown, having never met some of us mm. and know oh. anything about us. And it's just, it's such a difficult job. I guess at least he has an idea of what you're all about. But yeah, um, yeah no, I don't envy them. That's for sure. Yeah, but especially in S and C, when you've you know everybody's got all their niggles and their yeah. specifics. Well, yeah, that. the first program he said, yeah, I was like, no, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I can't do this, can't do this. <laughs> uh, Danny, Danny is obviously known to you guys from the, the national squad, most of the squad, if not all of the squad, from the national perspective. But Johnny Bell, the new attack coach, is coming in as well, with, um, and he also has some fresh ideas. He's a, he's a bubbly personality, he's an infectious personality, and yeah, uh, I suppose you've only. Has he been in with you guys maybe a week now? Was it last week? Was his first? Uh, yeah, like two weeks, I suppose. Two so weeks. sort of our last week of voluntary training, he came around to Murrayfield and sort of just introduced himself mm-hmm. um, while we were in our base. And then last week was his first you know, week that he could get us on the pitch and get some get a small amount of time with us. Um, He'll be excited about working with, with Glasgow like as an attack-minded team as you are and as individuals. I'd imagine he'll be really excited about the opportunity to, to help add to that. Yeah, no, I'm sure. And, like, and you know, he was a defence coach at Gloucester um, mm-hmm. when he was there. So I think it, you know, it sounds like he's really excited to be back on the, the other side of the game. How have you um, enjoyed playing for Glasgow over the last couple of seasons? Has it been a bit different? Because obviously you came from, from the seven stuff as well. So how's that yeah. been kind of transitioning back into 15s and, and playing for Glasgow? Oh, I've, I've loved it, Rachel. Um, you know, I arrived at a, at a really good time, sort of February, at the beginning of, of this year. Um, you know, we, we ended up, Getting a good run of games in, um, played week in, week out, and you know, in front of a sold out Scotson, which was which was awesome. And for me, before the sevens, I'd been in South Africa um, at, at the Greek Quiz in Central South Africa, and you know, we, we struggle for for numbers down there um, in terms of fans. Um, you know, we probably get somewhere between five hundred and a thousand. So then to come over here, mm-hmm. um, first of all, you know, go on the sevens, go on the circuit was awesome, and see the the, the you know the, the vibe and that sort of thing there. But then to come back into fifteens and um, just feel sort of that infectious atmosphere at Scotston. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I think I only played my first game in the rain at the start of this. <laughs> so, like you said, it, was, you know, it just couldn't have been a better start. We yeah. had so many home games, all of them, you know, in dry conditions. It was, it was awesome. But the, the and then seven, Storm Kira came and 
<laughs> Showed you what it can be like. On a last definitely balances out. And then this season, <laughs> come round and the, the first game we played in our white away kit was down in Zebra in like knee high mud. <laughs> um, yeah. But the sevens, the sevens was a, a, you know, a, a sector that you really enjoyed, and that was a the kind of your first involvement in Scottish rugby. How, how did that come around? Obviously, your mum's Scottish, isn't she? Yeah. Um, and and you, you grew up knowing a lot, supporting a lot uh, around Scotland uh, from from overseas. But was there contact for a number of months before you, you joined the Seven? Or was it, did you know there was something in the pipeline or did it come out of the blue a little bit? Oh, it came out of the blue, to be honest. Marcy. Like you say, you know, I grew up, I played fullback at school, so I grew up yeah. watching you. <laughs> the ball up and down the field, you know, wondering if oh, I'd ever get that to play over here. Um, How can that thin guy ever play rugby? <laughs> oh. <laughs> and we were actually, um, I was at the Cape Town Sevens as a student. Mm-hmm. Um, had had a, you know, a couple of drinks at, in the stands on the Saturday. So I woke up with a, a croaky voice on the Sunday and got a call from Scott Johnson, mm-hmm. um, who was the director of rugby at the time. And um, he had been told, him and uh, JD, John DL, Mm-hmm. Um, had chatted to my agent, and they had found out that I was um, that I was Scottish qualified through my mum, like you said. Mm-hmm. Um, so the first thing he asked me when he heard my voice was, "Were you in the Were you in the stands last night?" I said, "Yeah." I was. <laughs> um, good, good honesty. Yeah, exactly. So that was December 2017, and then JD was really good about keeping in contact with me and um, to set up like almost like a month trial. Yeah, I'm over in February of 2018. Yeah, did three weeks here in. Uh, at Ravenscraig with the Sevens and then did the mm-hmm. Vegas and Vancouver legs mm-hmm. with the Sevens team. Mm-hmm. And again, you know, JD just kept in touch with me saying that there was an opportunity for a Sevens contract, mm-hmm. which then I probably signed, must have been around July, July-ish. I remember you coming to Scotland and doing some stuff for Glasgow as well. Was, was that during the, the first, you know, your first trip over? Uh, no, so then that was, uh, that was, then as I'd signed permanently at the end of that year, mm-hmm. I think the October, um, then I came over early and did two or three weeks with That's Glasgow right. at the yeah. beginning. There. That's good, and then it was pretty it accelerated pretty quickly from there. Some good performances and then professional uh, contracts and performances for uh, for Glasgow. The Pro 14 final must have been a highlight as well for for Glasgow. Yeah. Now, although the, the disappointment of it, but personally to to start and run on in that was was pretty special. Yeah, no, that was awesome. Um, you know, I've never seen that many people at a game like you say and. Every time you talk about it, you, you just kick yourself out because it, it all just aligned for us. You know, everything mm-hmm. was, was building and we had the final in our home city and that mm-hmm. um, still just eats away that we didn't manage to get it over the line. But, you know, 57,000 people at, at Celtic Park. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I can still remember getting off the bus and I had my headphones on and I looked out and I was just like, whoa. <laughs> um, there's a lot, of, a lot of Glasgow people here. So I, I even said to myself, just take your headphones off and just yeah. enjoy this for, for five seconds. This is, this is cool. Mm, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. And the, um, quickly following that was the kind of extended World Cup training squad last year at this time, which again, and things move quickly in sport, but it was a, quite a rapid mm. kind of involvement with it with a national setup and, and deservedly so. But that that must have just added to the a kind of the whole experience of of, uh, of playing so well and, and developing and feeling your 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 form develop as you quite rattle quickly through the months. Yeah, um, and I think definitely a big motivating factor through those last games because obviously I didn't get named in the in the core, the original mm-hmm. squad of forty two. There were mm-hmm. uh, Gregor left two places, one back right. and one forward that he said he was going to announce after the after the final, and he had phoned me when they announced the original squad and said that I was one of the I wasn't being named, but I was one of the boys in contention for that spot. Um, and one of the things he said to me was, you know, we want to see how you perform in in playoff rugby, how you go mm-hmm. there. So. Um, yeah, it was quite difficult actually to sort of, you know, you've always got that on the back of your head, but you've got to make sure that it doesn't take over the focus. Um, mm-hmm. But like you say, it just added to it, you know, after the final, then mm-hmm. you phoned me the next day. Um, again, asked about the partying. I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it, you, it's just your deep voice, Kyle. Put that in. There's <laughs> your next excuse. <laughs> off the back of that, you got your first cap, I think, this Six Nations just gone. Is that right? Yeah. Um, and again, I obviously didn't make the World Cup squad, but I think that whole experience mm-hmm. just um, meant that I came into the Six Nations and I'm just way more settled, you know, and yeah. almost with a bit more confidence as to what to expect and what, you know, what was going to go on. Um, and so then, you know, I, didn't, I wasn't involved in the first two, three games, um, but I kind of just, you know, just kept trying to put my foot in the door and every time, you know, got off for Glasgow, just 
trying to make sure I was making a pest of myself for for the coaches, you know. Um, and it seems, yeah, eventually I'd, I'd irritated them enough that they... <laughs> the right way to do it, though. Yeah. <laughs> There's a bit of talent and work rate and effort in there as well, I think. Uh, <laughs> you're pretty hard on yourself. Nah. Um, but yeah, managed to sneak it in just in time. Um, yeah, for the... supposed to be on the bench again for the Wales game, which was also just an, a weird experience there. Uh, mm. Travelling yeah. down to Cardiff and everybody's like, what are you guys doing? This game cannot go on. And mm. we were like, please let it go on. <laughs> Was that game, game called off on the day? It was on the day, wasn't it? No, uh, so we were, we were on the bus on the way to captains. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. We've been told repeatedly, you know, Wales rugby have guaranteed this game's going on, this game's going on. Um, and then literally Gregor took the mic at the front of the bus on the way to captains and he was like, sorry guys, game's off. <laughs> and within like an hour, we had gone from preparing for captains oh. to all of a sudden we had like an eight and a half hour bus trip back to, <laughs> back to Edinburgh. It was a proper weird end to the tournament, wasn't it? Yeah. No, you guys finish your games. <laughs> we oh, uh, uh, only played two. Um, so we and, one of those, and one of those was postponed. And one of those was postponed as well because of the weather. So <laughs> we played one game on time, um, which was the first one. And then we had postponed game against England, um, which got pushed back a day. So that was okay. Mm. And then our next three games got cancelled. We You travelled to Italy, didn't you? Yeah, we went to Italy mm. and got dragged out of bed on the day of the game and <laughs> told it was cancelled. Oh. Uh, and then France game cancelled the night before and then uh, Wales game was cancelled well in advance, so that was okay. Mm. But yeah, it was quite a, a really strange, strange mm. Six oh. Nations. But yeah, no, we'll hopefully get them replayed towards the end of the year. What about um, kind of off the field, Kyle? You, um, you were at Stellenbosch Uni in, in South Africa, is that right? Is, yeah. Uh, what did you study out there? Uh, so I studied a, a BSc, a, a science degree in uh, physiology and biochemistry. Um, so I wasn't quite smart enough to get into medicine, which was the ultimate goal. Um, <laughs> oh. I kind of did like the, the entry level one. <laughs> um, so I got that behind my name and then... Um, so you finished that? In teaching. Ah. So, yeah. so you finished at Stellenbosch. Is it true as well? I've heard for years, that, I don't know, this could be one of these facts that aren't true, but I'll ask you, you might know. <laughs> Stellenbosch... University is the, the rugby club that has the most teams in the world. Yeah. True, they had like yeah. 54 teams going out every weekend or something ridiculous. Like that. Did, is yeah. that true or, or do you know the uh, number? It is true, but there's, there's like a twist to it. So it's so Stellenbosch Rugby Club has, has like 900 registered um, players. Hmm. But what they don't tell you is that they incorporate sort of the, all the halls teams under their banner because you have right. to pay uh, yeah. Stellenbosch Rugby Club membership fees. Right. Um, so that's where they get the massive them, you know, their massive numbers. The the club itself, they play, you know, they play for Stellenbosch. I think there's they roll up nine or ten teams each right. week. I was there uh, because we used to have a standing joke with some of my friends. Imagine if you were on the bench for the forty seconds this week. <laughs> <laughs> you had a cracking, you had a cracking fifteen minutes, and you got promoted to the forty first. So it must, yeah, have, exactly. been, it must <laughs> have been some notice board outside the rugby club on the Thursday night. The team sheet's going up, but. <laughs> if, it's, if it's not all one club that makes perfect sense but uh, <laughs> so you studied over there you finished you finished your studies and did you say so you, you, were, you were starting to teach uh, no so, so then I, I did a postgrad in teaching right um, my fourth year um, so I did four years there and then the fifth year I kind of had signed up for a diploma just to play in the in the uni comp and then was lucky enough to pick up a, a professional contract or a curry cup contract off the back of that so then I just I found out in like the February that I that I was leaving, so I didn't go to a class from from about the first <laughs> online <thing>. online lectures. <laughs> yeah, and what about off the field in Glasgow? Is uh, what keeps you busy away from the away from Scotland? <laughs> um, well, from March through to <laughs> I suppose August September, I probably I get on the golf course as, as many times as I can. Nice. Um, you know, and that was a nice way to to sort of meet the guys off the field when I first arrived. You know, Wilson gets you up standing on a chair your first day and fires mm-hmm. all these questions at you. But one thing I said was, oh, I'm so keen to get out on the golf course. Um, and I think I probably, the first time, I think I went out with George Horn and Nick Frisbee and Brandon Thompson. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, um, you know, Glasgow's got a good relationship with like Pollock and Douglas Park mm-hmm. and um, Windy Hill. So, um, yeah, if it's dry, not like today. Um <sighs> I'll be out on the golf course. Otherwise, Squiggy's um, organising coffees all over Glasgow. <laughs> um, so we do that. Otherwise, to be honest, a lot of us play PlayStation, um, <laughs> which was a habit that yeah, isn't our best and certainly 
um, you know, we put in some good hours over lockdown. No. What, um, who's uh, two questions on that? Who's who's the top golfer in the squad? Is there a is there a standout candidate? I was going to ask the same oh, thing. That's a contentious one. I I would say of, of the boys that all of us play together, me and George are probably are probably on par. You know, we we if we play against each other, it's, it's always a good battle. Um, and, George, you know, George, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong. I might be totally stereotyping here, but I'd imagine George would be fairly straight, knock it in the middle. Short game's excellent. Oh yeah. Uh, you, you, you'll hit the ball a bit further but maybe a bit more wayward would that be true or? yeah no definitely um, <laughs> and I mean no one has to talk about how competitive the horns are so um, yeah we get fired up for those games and secondly what's the the, the game of choice on the on the Playstation or the Xbox the Call of Duty at the moment we're all Still? into um, yes yeah, so we love going to war a lot of the boys play FIFA <laughs> as well. I'm not I'm not massive on FIFA um, and I've only got one TV um, in my Ellie, my fiance, um, yeah, she sort of regulates the hours, and she doesn't play Call of Duty then. No, no, no. no. <laughs> she hates the noise of it as well. She bought <laughs> Christmas present was noise cancelling headphones that you have to listen to all the bombs going off. Is it is a is is popular in the the women's game, Rachel? PlayStation. Yeah. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> on, the, on the on the trips and the international trips, does everyone? No, know, um, we actually tend to we don't really use any kind of um games on tvs or computers or anything like that we tend to play like cards and stuff mm. like that um more sociable <laughs> yeah no, no. we also have a, a team band who who regularly get together and make songs and stuff like that so no we we stray away from playstation and xbox and all these things are you in the band <laughs> Um, loosely <laughs> I'm allowed to shake a rack on that bit so Rachel mentioned your first cap Kyle um, against France the, the last time really last last game BT Murrayfield we, we mentioned it with everyone and, and it's a similar answer about the, the culmination of the hard work and experience but from your perspective just, just winning that cap what was the, the feelings and the emotion and the pride like and the when you got the nod and you were coming off the bench in front of a full house. Yeah, oh, it was awesome. Most, to be dead honest, you know, the first thing I probably felt on when I, you know, I came on for Sean Maitland, and I think the first one was probably just massive relief. You know, I remember just like looking around and being like, like I'm, I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> it's ticked off kind of thing. Um, but then I was also just real nervous in the stands before that. You know, as you come out after half time, you know, I'm probably looking up at the clock every 15 or 20 seconds to see what the time is um, and I said after the game it got to a patch around 60 minutes where mm-hmm. you know France were camped down in R22 and um, the rain started picking up and all these sort of things and the game started you know started evening out a lot more and I started thinking am I even going to get on you uh, um, and I was just real thankful that Greg said uh, early on you know told Edgy he said tell Carl the next stoppage is on um, so I probably had about two or three minutes to get ready um, my heart rate shot through the roof and then <laughs> Yeah, got the first involvement in on the pitch and it was oh, it was just awesome. Um, Dad managed to get up, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. South Africa. Yeah, it's excellent. Um, and again, we, we got so lucky with the weather. It was a dry day. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think probably the best part about it was that I got to make my debut at Murrayfield, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd watched all the Six Nations games the year before. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, each time I just found, you know, saying to myself, like, I'm, I'm so done wondering what this feels like. You know, I want to know what this, what mm-hmm. this feels like. Mm-hmm. Um, must have been nice to to come away with a win as well yeah no it was awesome <laughs> um especially you know the way our six nations had gone you know we i probably felt like we'd performed better than what the results were saying so mm-hmm. um you know we came off a good win in italy and then you know to get a win at home was, was awesome who was uh you came on the right wing didn't you who, who was i can't remember i should do who was uh, the opposite man but did fiku move out to the wing no uh, Fiku Sherbert, you're testing me now as well. I think he started in the midfield. I can't remember if he moved out to the wing or, or who. Yeah. Do you remember who your opposite number was? No, I think it would have been Fiku. Teddy Thomas was, was on the other side. That's right. And he went off, uh, and I think they made one or two changes. And I think Fiku, who's uh, yeah. just any time, as you know, through sevens as well, like you play France, their ability to just, you know, spark something is totally yeah. unique. And you're right at that point in the game, I think they, they came back into it a little bit. Um, yeah. But yeah, and, and you feel quite exposed sometimes in the wing when you come on, you're fresh. Some of the guys inside you're a bit more tired. The, the gaps get 
you know, closer together for in terms of defence. It, it leaves yeah. the person on the end, the winger, so much more space to cover on your own against a Fiku or a Booty, I think was at full back and Terry Thomas yeah. as you say. So it's it's almost in that position, just commentating through the game and, and making sure that you're part of the system because the urge is to do it on your own, but it's so dangerous against you know French side to to kind of try and yeah. solve it on your own. You need to work together, don't you? No, for sure. Um, and that's where, you, you know, it's, it's good to have someone like Hoggy behind you there. Um, yeah. You know, he came straight up to me and, you know, and then he's just in your ear the whole time as well, keeping you calm and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, sometimes screaming in your ear. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> screaming. Sometimes, nah. uh, sometimes not as calm as other times with Hoggy. <laughs> nah, I think anybody who's been in that position, Rachel, you'll be the same. Any teammate, when you see somebody win their first cap, you feel this... It isn't, it's not a duty, it's just a responsibility that you want to make sure that everything's going to be fine. Yeah, um, definitely. So you, you find yourself helping these guys and quite often the first capper just turns and says, hey, calm down, I've got this, it's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm cool. And they're the calmest person in the, in the environment. No. Yeah, I think because everyone feels like the, the same thing, like when they see them come on, they feel proud and they want them mm-hmm. to make them feel good so then they end up having 14 people come up to them and say, you, you're fine, you've got this. And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, I do. I know, I know. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so we obviously talked a little bit around your sevens career and stuff how do you feel that being a part of the sevens program and playing a bit of sevens kind of helped you progress through your rugby and into a kind of international 15s player now um i think probably mentally was was where it helped most rachel um mm-hmm. you know it's it's such a harsh environment those those sevens weekends you know you got three games the first day three games the second day so it's about you know being able to sort of switch on, switch off, and then switch on again. Um, and the beauty of sevens, and you know why it's so attractive to watch, is because anything can happen. Um, and so to get yourself mentally ready, you know, three times a day, where you have to absolutely be at your best. You know, otherwise if you slip up once, then you lose, and you're out the pool, and then sort of all of a sudden you're in the back draw. So I think sort of just you know that baptism of fire almost mentally. Um, you know, were probably the biggest learnings I got. Um, you know, I I, probably, I did exactly what, what Mossy's talking about in the 15s game. You know, I got so excited going on the first time, rushed out of the line against Kenya, you know, got stepped and, you know, he was straight through under the poles. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then that's the first clip that comes up on the on the review screen. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there were a few hard lessons learned in, in sevens, you know, and I, I actually had a, a quite a tricky start. You know, I, I just didn't, you know, didn't get as much game time as I was hoping for and, really struggled to get on the pitch and you know and then seven minutes 14 minutes flies by and then all of a sudden you're only on the pitch for one or two minutes and you know and like Marcy says then it's so hard not to go into this mode where you just want to make something happen in these in these two minutes so um I would say almost you know you, it was a lot of maturing that you, yeah. you do in that time you know um and then came back into the 15s and you know kind of felt like I'd, I'd learned you know a lot of good lessons the nature of the sevens environment means you have to learn really quickly as well you know, we've said we've spoken about this often on the podcast about how how great it is in terms of your your skill development. For example, you've more space to cover on defence, so it's harder to defend. You've got you're probably under more fatigue, um, more often than not. But I do genuinely think that you, the mental side is one of the biggest factors, positive factors of playing sevens, because exactly as you just described, and also in stadiums full of people. Yeah. You know, so it does actually, it, it, it ticks so many boxes in preparation for the 15s game um, physically, but also, as you say, mentally, it is, it is really important. And you've already given two or three really good examples of where that helped you when your number went up, you know, against France two or three yeah. months or four or five months ago. And you, having those experience, dealing with it, it just it is, it's, it's a brilliant development tool, not for everyone, front five may argue with me but uh, it's, it's a brilliant development tool for uh, for young players and you know the world over no exactly and I actually almost wonder now you know from South Africa we, we play 15 men from like you know from mm. 8 7 or 8 mm-hmm. um, and I always say to a lot of people now you know I wonder what would happen if you if you let kids play 7s you know till they were mm-hmm. 10 11 just because like you say from a pure rugby perspective you know the highlights or the spotlight it puts you in with all your skills mm-hmm. Um and you know how there's no you know there's no real set positions, there's only really set piece, and then you're all sort of the same player. So, um, yeah, yeah. It feels like that. I, I'd I'd never played sevens, uh, played fifteens until I reached high school. All our development was was sevens. Oh. Uh, what about you, Rachel? Did you did you 
<laughs> do sevens as well. I was about to say, I'm not sure many forwards would have the same opinion that we should play sevens. <laughs> um, I have played social sevens, but never anything no. slightly serious. That's going to be one of the hardest games you'll ever play. It's, it's, it's no, brutal, isn't imagine. it? <laughs> and, you know, just physically, you just long. You just, every time you go to a sevens tournament, you're like, oh, no. First game, yeah. you know, first game, is it? and you th- just get your second wind. And if you're lucky, it probably comes some point towards the end of the first tie. But you know, by the second tie, you've blown your lungs out, and it, it does get slightly easier. But there's, there's very little preparation for how horrible it's going to feel for, for the first 14 minutes. Oh, You're selling it. I know, sure. exactly. <laughs> going to be truthful. Going to feel truthful. It can't all be bells and whistles, eh? We've obviously talked about loads of stuff that you've achieved in the last kind of year to two years. Um, in terms of looking forward now, have you got any goals for, for the next year in terms of both club and, and country? Yeah, well, I'd love for Mossy to teach me how to kick, so I didn't need it. <laughs> <laughs> You're a quick learner. We'll be fine. You can do that. Hey, yeah, he's joking. He can do that as well. <laughs> oh, so the consistency is just not there, but... Um, oh, to... T- to yeah, great question, Rachel. I suppose, you know, you really want to impose impose my. You know, I want to impose myself in the national setup now. You know, and uh, the competition sort of centre back three um, in the in the yeah. side at the moment is is immense. So, um, I suppose the first goal is to just get back playing rugby. You know, we all just want to be back out there on the field. Yeah. Um, and it's about you know grabbing these opportunities now. You know, hopefully, you know we've we've got a good number of test matches coming up in the next short little while. You know, the, the rest of this year and the beginning of next year. So. Um, just want to put my best foot forward and and you know try to build up as many appearances for Scotland and Glasgow that I can. Where do you see? You know, you, you have the ability. To, so you grew up mainly as Kenny fullback, didn't you? Uh, played consistently well on the wing. Started the Pro 14 final as a centre. I think at 13. You are really comfortable in all those positions. Is there one you prefer, or or one you you don't prefer as much, or, or is there when you're setting goals and aims, is there a position that you would you don't have to tell us, but you would you would really like to go after over the over the other ones. Yeah, I I, I still want to go after the thirteen jersey most. Um, yeah. um and you know if anyone asks me I, I tell them that so you know yeah. both Danny and, and Greg know that. Um mm-hmm. and they both told me where you know where I stand on um in their eyes. And I think the gap between sort of how much I like sense and how much I like wing is is you know probably almost even now. And I think that's got a lot to do with the way that Glasgow and mm-hmm. Scotland use their wingers mm-hmm. um you know it's a much more free reign role and attack and you know mm-hmm. so many involvements and um both glasgow and scotland you know see see the back three as a big strength and and looking to incorporate that so mm-hmm. um from that point of view you know i've really enjoyed being able to grow my game as a winger mm-hmm. um and you know probably next on that list is to, is to develop a more consistent kicking game you know and just keep mm-hmm. adding sort of mm-hmm. strength to the bow we spoke last week with, um, with sam about understanding roles when you when you cover or you can play different positions or you're covering different positions going into a game whether starting or on the bench and we spoke about the importance of kind of line out really for him between second row and back row and it's the same for especially 13 or wing such a difficult position to defend in and you know you might have to change position during the game and then likelihood towards the end of the game might be that crucial moment where you have to get the call right in attack or the call right in defence so it's extra work and preparation when you play multi positions, isn't it? Yeah, no, it certainly is. But I think, you know, if, if you can get that understanding of both, that almost, you know, they, they start to complement each other because then, mm-hmm. you know, I'm on the wing and, you know, then I know how the 13 may be thinking or, or what mm-hmm. he's feeling, you know, and so you, you tend to, uh, like, start using both to help you, mm-hmm. um, help you with that understanding of everything. Mm-hmm. Well, it's been great. We've actually spoken for, for quite a while, Kyle. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed having you on and getting your insights into. Simmons, 15s, Glasgow, uh, Scotland, and we just really appreciate your time and, and, and thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, guys. Um, yeah, really good to get on. I've enjoyed listening to the podcast as it's going on. So, cheers, guys. Well, that was great, wasn't it? We, uh, Rachel, have a, a good old chat with, with Kyle Steen. Somebody who comes across really well. We said it last week about Sam, but just mm. you can hear how how determined he is, how driven he is. Uh, the strong mentality he has, but he's just a another polite, decent guy yeah. who's uh, who's working really hard. Yeah, he seems like a really nice guy, and it's it's interesting because he's had quite a varied journey. 
um, mm-hmm. but also to kind of hear the learnings that he's taken from that journey as well is really interesting. I think one for for young players definitely to listen into. It's a it's a good point you make about the, the kind of varied journey because I, I think it makes a more rounded player. You know, yeah. whether it's study, whether it's you know moving in, in South Africa and playing for for different uh, clubs in South Africa. He spoke about how they struggle for a, for a deep meaningful support there. Then the, the kind of yeah. the learning he got from playing in front of big crowds in the sevens and, and for Glasgow. He's as you say studied as well. He's done a postgraduate. So that that kind of rounded approach, that varied approach, is something we try and promote really for our players to do because. If there's only kind of one strand of rugby and that's it, you don't develop as well, do you? No, 100% you don't. And there's so many learnings he'll probably take from those different areas of his life that, that will benefit him as a rugby player and vice mm-hmm. versa. Um, and at the end of the day with rugby, you just never know when your last game might be as well. So mm-hmm. I always, like, whenever I chat to some of the younger girls, I think it's so important that you you have other stuff going on in your life because... It is quite a danger when things get taken away from you and you, you don't know what's next. So um, I think, you know, hearing about all the stuff he's done along the way is, is amazing and is, he's a really good example for, for young rugby players. The other wee thing that thought was, will we see a change in how the game's played or will there yeah. be any differences because it's been such a long time since he's played? He spoke about that contact work, about some of the, the regulations not, not really changing, just being enforced more. Yeah. Um, and the big topic for me is the creation of space and how we create space. Uh, and he spoke about his footwork and defend. And are there any cracking ideas out there for creating space in the rugby field? You know, coaches mm. will think of them, um, but then they're quite usually quite conservative because they, they don't like straying too far from 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 trends. But I don't know. Would you have any ideas on, on space creation, or do you think it's <laughs> I'm worth probably not it, a lot of space. You, <laughs> yeah. I tend to run away from it. That's the point, though. That's that's no, the point. I know, no, I know. Um, no, I don't know, but I think it would be interesting. I think there's also a lot you can take from other sports as well, mm-hmm. you know, like watching other sports and, and, and seeing how they do it. And their sports obviously different in the sense of different type of ball and, and how they pass it around. But I always think that we should take more from, from, watching, from watching other sports as well. Mm-hmm. No, it's just, it's just something that's a personal thing that's hanging on mm. there. How can we create more space in the field? There's yeah. obviously, there's law trials going on at the moment in Super Rugby. The, the, the kind of most famous one really or the most uh, well-known one maybe is the 50-22 law where uh, if you kick from inside your own half and the ball bounces out, a touch in the opposite 22, um, you then are rewarded with throwing. And yeah. similarly, if you kick from inside your 22 and it bounces out over halfway, you're rewarded with throwing. So the idea is to drop defenders into the backfield, take more defenders away from the front field, because it really yeah. should be quite easy pickings for a decent kicking game team to find that space. So, yeah. so that I've been watching kind of the, the Australian stuff with that. It's been some good examples of it. So that is a one way of thinking. But if anybody does have any ideas, to, <laughs> we can take forward or debate or, or discuss, because it's, uh, I think it's, it's important that we, we still look to create Philip space game, rather yeah. than get a bit not too physically orientated but we know, who knows who knows in three or yeah. four weeks time when the games kick off maybe <laughs> maybe we'll get a different view yeah know, it'll be worth, worth getting in touch if anybody has some worldly ideas uh, and we'll get Al and Jamie to discuss them when they're back maybe they'll have yes. the ideas Rachel I somehow would be very surprised <laughs> 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 well thanks again for listening to the official Scottish Rugby podcast um, thanks again to Kyle Stain for his his, uh, his insight and, and really enjoyed his, his, his chat next week we'll be back to uh, bring you news from the Edinburgh Rugby Camp and we look forward to bringing that to you